We take the things that we have for granted. Uh, it's not until we start suffering that we truly appreciate what we have. And the Bible never once tells us that this life will be easy. What he does guarantee is that he will be with us, that God is with us, that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. His promise to us is that if we will continue to run this race, I love what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. We've been talking about that admonition to run the race. As Paul put it, go ahead and put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You remember these were the key verses that we've been talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24, don't you realize? that in a race everyone runs but only one person gets the prize he says run to win Uh, we've got to run to win all athletes are disciplined in their training they do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize Uh, so I run with purpose in every step I am not just shadow boxing Uh, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that um, preaching to others, I myself might become disqualified. I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about what does that mean to run this race and then at the end of the race to become disqualified. I, I, I don't believe that what Paul is talking about here is the, the loss of our salvation uh, because that in itself has been, has been paid for through Jesus' shed blood. His grace is freely given. We accept his grace. What this picture that he's given to us is that somewhere along the line we will lose the fullness of what it means to run the race. To accomplish the race. We don't want to become disqualified from the race. That we, there is so much that we can attain in this life. Now, now that doesn't mean that, uh, that you can just do whatever you want and still expect to get to heaven. There is, there is the, the, the reality is that God has called us to be separated. He's called us to be saints. That means separated ones. It means that we're running a race not to attain salvation, but in order that we may be perfected in His grace. What happens if, if we're just fighting? How many, what happens if, I, if I'm just tempted? What happens when I'm, when I'm going through this life and, and I'm confronted with the sin that so easily entangles me, which is right in front of me? What happens when I'm having to, to slug it out? How do I, how do I get there? What, what, is the, what is the key component to not being disqualified then? The Bible gives a very clear definition of that. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. Look at what he says in Titus chapter 2, verse 7. He says this, And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything that you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of of your teaching now he's not talking about your salvation is from good works what he's saying that because of your salvation now then your good works need to show the integrity of your life what is integrity what does it mean to live a life of integrity if I'm to title my, my sermon today, it's, it's run to integrity. We're, we're called to run a life with and to integrity. So we're constantly striving for integrity and we're constantly living out being, having a life of integrity. The Latin word for integrity is the word integritatum. And it literally means soundness, wholeness, or completeness. It's actually a mathematical term. It means that everything, all the parts are together. It is complete. It is sound. Figuratively, it means purity, correctness, blamelessness. It's from that integer, the whole. The integer is the whole. We are made whole. So we're supposed to live a life that is whole before God. I was reading about an investment banker who needed an in-house counsel So he interviewed a a young lawyer. Mr. Peterson, uh, she asked, or he asked, uh, would you say you're honest? Honest, replied Peterson. Let me tell you something about honesty. My father lent me $85,000 for my education, and I paid every penny the minute I tried my first case. Impressive. And what sort of case was that? 
my dad sued me for the money. <laughs> Integrity. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing, not just when people are looking at you, but are you whole? Are you doing it when others are not looking at you? Because the reality is that integrity starts from the inside out. It is not a manifest, it is, it is not you trying to put on a cover or a face or a facade of something that you're not. Integrity starts from the inside. Deal with the heart and then the outside begins to manifest itself. Any unhealthy plant is unhealthy first on the inside before it ever exhibits itself on the outside. Just like every human, every person under God's earth, He created us, and unless we learn to deal with the health issues on the inside, we will never truly manifest His grace on the outside. Integrity gives your life credibility it allows people to be able to look at you and know who you are and know what you believe know where you stand integrity is a calculated path of living free from regret what plan do you have for dealing with the circumstances that would disqualify you from finishing the race or even winning the race if you did finish the race. What things do you have in your life? What, what, what disciplines have you, have you exacted in your life to help you finish this race and still be called my good and faithful servant? Enter into the presence, the words we want to hear when we leave this life and enter into the presence of God we want it be, to be said of us by God, well done, my good and faithful servant. If that's, not what you're, if that's not what you're running for in this life, my friend, you've lost focus of what it means to finish the race. We must, we must be learning, we must be running to hear the words that God has for us. And so we've got to put some things, some calculated things in our lives. We've we've got to count the cost. We've got to know what it means to be complete, to be whole in this life. I like the story that's given in the book of Genesis chapter 39. It's the story of Joseph. And many of you guys know Joseph's story. Some of you may not. And so I want to briefly tell you what happened. So there was this guy named Joseph. He was the son of, of Jacob, and Jacob would be called Israel later on. He would name his, he would be changed, his, na- his name would be changed. He would have uh, multiple sons, at least 12 sons. One of them was actually Joseph, and uh, his father loved him. So much so that his father saw that God had a plan for Joseph, and so he, he, he gave him the manager's coat. The Bible calls it the multicolored coat. It's actually the manager's coat in that day and age. And so if, if you were a shepherd or a herder, the, the, the coat identified who you were. And so he had this coat. It identified him above all of his older brothers, so he lorded it over his brothers by saying, hey, look, my dad loves me. He's put me as a manager over all of you guys. And, and God has given me some visions and some dreams. And they're like, who do you think you are? So they start conniving and they start going through some stuff in their own, in their own heads, uh, plotting against their brother. And eventually they come up to this idea that they're going to throw him down into a pit, into a well. And then when the next caravan comes through town, they're going to pull them out and sell them to the caravan. And that caravan was headed to Egypt. Well, they did that. He gets to Egypt, is sold into slavery. The, the place that he winds up in chapter 39 is in, actually in the, the, the head of all of the guards for, for, the king of Israel, for the king of Egypt, Potiphar. So he's in Potiphar's house and God is blessing him. He's a slave, yet God is blessing him. You'll, you'll notice that we'll read, let's, let's go ahead and read, uh, and starting in verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, 
So he succeeded in everything that he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything that he did. Was he free? No. Could he do whatever he wanted? No, he was still a slave, but he, God gave him success. From the day that Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and his livestock flourished, fulfilling what God said that I will bless those whom bless you. If they, if if you will be a blessing, if, if they will bless you, then I'm going to bless them. So God fulfilled his promise even to Joseph, even in the midst of his slavery. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative ris- responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Now, verse 7 Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept, he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came, and she grabbed him by the cloak, demanding, demanding come and sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and that he had fled, she called out to her servant. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband, look, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he ran outside and he got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. The Hebrew slave you've brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside and he left his cloak with me. And Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and he threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in, where? The prison. And he showed him faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Multiple times in that narrative we see that the Lord was with Joseph. That the Lord blessed him even in the midst of every trying circumstance. Here's the reality, my friend, that just because, just because we are blessed of God, just because we're called by Him, just because we're anointed by Him, just because we have His presence, does not mean that we will not have conflict. Nor does it mean that we will not have temptation. Nor does it mean that we will not have trials. Every one of us will face trials, temptations, conflicts, and circumstances that put us in a predicament. Many times in predicaments that they might put our own lives on the line. The reality is that all around the world today, if you're looking at the headlines, you will see that there are Christians who are being martyred, who are giving their lives because they refuse to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior of their lives. One of our own Assembly of God pastors in Burkina Faso recently gave his life. He and his son were coming out of a church service on a Sunday morning three weeks ago. And as they came out, some radical, um, some radical elements of other religious faiths came against them. 
and, t- and told him you must renounce your faith so that your church can, can, can also renounce their faith. And he says, I will not renounce my faith. And they shot him dead. And then they took his son to the back of the church and shot him dead. The reality is that, my friend, this life, we're, we're afforded so much. And because we're afforded so much, sometimes we take our faith for granted. And sometimes we fall victim to some heresies that keep popping up. <laughs> some distortions of truth and reality of what God's Word wants us to know is that in this life, we're going to face trials. We're going to face troubles. We're going to face sickness. We're going to face disease. We will be afflicted by the same thing. Listen, the sun comes up on the just as much as it comes up on the unjust. The ra- it rains on the just and on the unjust. We're reminded of that all the time. The, the difference between, between what happens when it rains on the just and on the unjust is that our God is with us. And that we can trust Him that He will be the source of our provision in the midst of every trial, in the midst of every circumstance. We can trust Him and His faithfulness. That doesn't mean that everything will be given to us the way that we expect it. As a matter of fact, sometimes it doesn't. And we read the, we've read the story. We read of Stephen who was martyred after preaching about Moses and his faithfulness. And yet he says, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they do. He repeated Jesus' own words on the cross. And he died on that very day. The reality is this. Listen, we're not being persecuted in that manner here today. Thank God. But if we were, where would you stand? How would you live your life? What kind of integrity do you have? Because the integrity of your faith, the integrity of what you believe, the integrity of everything that you profess as a believer today is a result of your decisions and of your disciplines. And if you're not disciplined in your life and if you continue to make decisions that keep knocking you off course, what will happen is on the day that you do face the biggest trial of your life, I want to ask you, will you be disqualified on that day? That's a good thing to ponder, to think about. Because here's what it is. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for you to deal with problematic situations. So that you can discipline your life, you can discipline your body, you can discipline your mind to know exactly what to do when you're faced and confronted with situations that are beyond your control, with situations that might lead into sin, with situations that might lead you to compromise on your beliefs. In this narrative, we see one of those applications for you and I. We can take away quite a bit out of this narrative. Could you, could you believe that with me? If you, what we just read, we see, we see at least five things that Joseph had disciplined himself, plans that he already had in place and things that he were dealing with on the fly, as if you will, to help him overcome this particular sin and circumstance. Now, for him, it was a sexual thing. There was adultery that was on the line. She was tempting him to sin sexually. For you, it might be something else. For you, it might be anger and rage that is unchecked and uncontrolled. For some of you, it might be some, some issue that you're dealing with internally. I don't know what it is that you're going through today. What specific issues and temptations and trials and circumstances that you're fighting today. But I want to tell you, there is a way of escape. The Bible tells us that Christ died to make in a way of escape for you and I. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit to make the way of escape. Here we see Joseph made his way of escape by a few things. Number one, he prepared his mind. He expected the temptation. Number one, expect the temptation. Here's the reality. Unless you're, unless you're prepared for the trial, 
You will, it will blindside you when it comes against you. You don't want to be caught blindsided in a trial. You don't want to be caught blindsided against the things that the enemy comes against you because, can I tell you, most of us fail because of a slow fade. There's a song. I love that song. It's a slow fade. Because it's the reality is this, is, is that we say, well, I, I'm expecting something big to happen, but the reality is that most of our trials start out small. And unless we're expecting it, and unless we're recognizing where we're walking, if you're not expecting the trial, it will catch you off guard. Every choice leads us down a path. What path are you walking today? So we must expect the temptation, expect the trial. Joseph expected the temptation. Read there, verse 6 and 7. Look what he says. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Now Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Did you know that in Scripture, this description is only given two other times? N- Old Testament narrative never, dis- never gives a physical, like, a-, a physical description of anybody's beauty other than Joseph, David, and Absalom. We know what happened to Absalom. We know what happened to David. Joseph should have prepared himself, and he was. He knew who he was. If God says, you're a handsome and attractive young man, I think everybody around you has kind of told you that. <laughs> the reality is I, that he, he, he had expected, he, he understood what he was up against because he knew who he was. He knew what the problem was, and the problem was not anything that he can control at that point. It was not anything, I mean, he couldn't make, he wasn't going to deface himself. He wasn't going to try to make himself look any uglier. (laughs) But when he, we enter into a situation, he knew that he had full control and, and he recognized that he, he recognized that that could be a problem later on. How do we know that? Because, because we give it on a second point here. Go on verse seven. He says, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. In other words, she told him, hey, you're good looking. You need to lay down with me. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just, oh, would you come? It was a demand. The Bible says that it was a demand. She demanded. Now, this is the, this is the wife of Potiphar, his boss. And she's telling him, come and sleep with me. He already knew, he knew that because of his beauty, because of, because of his power that he was afforded, that there was going to be situations that would rise up. So what does he do? The, the thing that we all need to do, number two, look at what it's, number two is examine to defend your values, examine yourself, examine your thoughts, examine your circumstances, examine your situations, give logical thought to what's going on around you. Here's the reality, for too many of us, we are just trying to survive. We get into survival mode, and we never truly have a plan for ourselves. We've never examined the things that we're going through. I, I, love, I love this. I, I, I love what one of my mentors used to, used to tell me. He said, prepare yourself for the three G's. He says, you got to guard yourself against the three G's. The glory... When you get up there and your people are patting you on the back and saying, well well done, he says, prepare yourself for the glory. Prepare yourself for the gold. You know, there'll be a lot of money that'll be coming through. You got to prepare yourself that you stay innocent against that. And he said, prepare yourself against the girls. (laughs) (laughs) I like what one university professor would do with his perspective students who were, who were going into the ministry. 
He'd give them, he'd actually say, give me a list of of things that people have done that have caused them to walk out of ministry and put them all in a jar. And he went around the room and he passed them all out. And he had every one of them take that. And he goes, take that right there, that disqualification of ministry. He goes, I want you to write an apology letter to your church, to your family, and to your friends. It's the most awakening thing. And I think about that for my own self. I've thought about it. I don't want to be the one writing that letter. I don't want to have to apologize for, for actions that I had not had forethought over. So we've got to examine to defend our own values. And we live in a culture where values, our values are constantly being questioned. They're constantly being watered down. And I want to ask you this. Have you come to the place where even Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where he says this. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if, any, and if anyone or someone asks about the hope that you have as a believer Are you ready to explain it? Another version says, are you ready to give an account of the hope that is in you? Can you count it up? Count the cost. We've got to to examine our values, examine the basis of our faith, and then be ready to defend it. Give a ready defense for the faith that we have. So in verse 8, Joseph refused And he said, look, I like that. Look, open your eyes, woman. Look. And my master trusts me with everything that it's in his household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. So he knew he, he knew what he was, he was dealing with. He was ready to defend it. He, even though it would, she would manipulate the circumstance and the situation, he knew in his own mind he had already reasoned out what he needed to do, why he needed to do it. And he gave his explanation to that woman. And then what happens next? Verse 9, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God, but she kept putting pressure. I want to ask you today, do you understand and do you acknowledge the potential sin that is in front of you? Number three, we've got to acknowledge the potential sin that is in front of us. We can't can't just live this life not acknowledging the fact that there is real sin in the world. I know that's, that's such a bad word, Pastor. Don't say that word. It's such a dirty word. It's so evil. Sin, sin, sin. Let me say it again. Sin. Yes, it's not a popular word. Sin. But can I tell you, sin will separate you from the love of God. We live in a world that says there is no such thing as sin. Do what you want. Please yourself. Do whatever it is that makes you feel happy. But the reality is this, is there are things that will cause you to be separated from the love of God. And that's called sin. Sin is missing the mark. Shooting for the wrong thing. You're aiming at the wrong thing. You're aiming at the wrong target. And here's the reality for you and I as we're living this life is that we've got to constantly be aiming for the right things, aiming for the things that are are pleasing to God. We've got to move forward in the direction that God has for you and I. If someone asks for your hope as a believer, be ready to explain it. It's, It's this acknowledgement, the acknowledgement in our minds what is, that, what is the finish line for you? I know we've been talking a lot about this over the last few weeks, but how do you frame your finish line? What is the hope that you have? Is it just fire insurance, not going to hell? Is that the only thing that you come to Christ for? 
is just say, well, I don't, I'm not going to go to hell. Is that how you frame your Christian life? Is it, is it just about not getting to hell? Is it just about getting to heaven? How do you frame your Christian walk? Because the reality is that you have the here and the now that, you, yes, we have the eternal perspective. But we have the here and the now that gets us to the eternal perspective. And what things here on earth are you aiming towards? What hope do you have? On the day-to-day basis. On the daily confrontations. On the real sins that so easily entangle. And so easily ensnare us. On the weights and the baggage that pulls us down. What goal are we going towards so that we can shed those things off and keep walking, keep running, keep moving in what God has for us? I've got to acknowledge that there is potential sin that is around me, and if I don't acknowledge the sin, then what happens is I deviate off course. I miss it. I miss the mark. I transgress. Remember transgression? Egress is a line that you walk. To transgress means to deviate, to come across the line. I live in iniquity. You remember what iniquity is? In equity, equity means balance. Iniquity means out of balance. Are you balanced in your approach in life? Or do you swing the pendulum every day? It's today my holy day. It's church day. It's Sunday. Today's Monday. Woo! It's my party day. I'm going to get to work. Just cuss them every all. I can't cuss them all out. I'm tired of them all. I'm just going to give them hell. I know people like that. Don't, don't say, Pastor, you shouldn't say that. The reality is we know people who go to church on Sunday and curse on Monday. I know I'm a little hard today. I try to keep it light. I want you guys to laugh. But the reality is this. Listen, we're all dealing with this. And and we're we're running a race, not not just to come to the end, but to win, to finish, to get to the end and say, hey, you know what? I've done well. I've done well. And I've got to acknowledge that there are going to be traps along the line, that there is going to be bait that is planted in front of me and that I can't bite. And I won't bite. Look at what he goes on to say. Number four, avoid the people, the places, and the things that make you vulnerable. Verse 10. He says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. I like that. Now, how practical is that? The reality is, for some people, we can't keep out of their way all the time. But you know what we can do? We can tune them out. See, there are influences around you, and it's not just people. There are influences all around you that are constantly putting negativity in your mind, things that, are, that, that will cause you to question your faith, things that are, that are constantly causing you to live in a state of misery, in a state of depression, in a state of hurt, in a state of mind in which you can't forgive, you can't let go, you can't move forward, and those those influences have been keeping you from living the life that God wants you to live. So are you avoiding those pitfalls? Or are you continuing to listen to the music that is making you feel depressed? Are you continuing to watch those TV shows that are causing you to question your faith? Are you continuing to be influenced by, by teachings that are contrary to the word of God? What are you filling yourself around? What is influencing you today? We have got to be people that are moving away from the influences and avoiding the influences that would make us vulnerable. Let let, let me me, me point that out. The word is vulnerable. You say, well, pastor, 
you know, my music, it doesn't, it doesn't make me sin. You're right, it may not make you sin. But it opens a door in your mind to question. It makes you vulnerable. That person that is constantly, constantly, constantly trying you, testing you, questioning you, questioning your faith. It, no, they're not going to, you're right, they're not going to make me move away from my faith. But if you're surrounded by them, they're making you vulnerable in other areas. There's so many influences around us that constantly wear at us. And the more that they wear at us, the more vulnerable we become to falling. Number five, avoiding her is not working. And sometimes we can't avoid every circumstance and every situation. What do we do? Look at what he does. Verse 11. One day, however, no one else was around. And when he went in to do his work, verse 12, she came and she grabbed him by the cloak and she demanded, come on, sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away and he ran and left his cloak in her hand as he ran out of the house. We've been talking about running. This is how this got into this series. He ran. Sometimes we got to run away from things. Don't think that you're too big. Say, Pastor, that will never happen to me. I heard the story of a, of a girl who had this uh, raccoon, and I think I shared this with you a few years ago, had this raccoon, a pet raccoon, and everybody told her, you don't want a pet raccoon. Don't, don't get a pet raccoon. What happens with a pet raccoon is that at a certain age, uh, a few months, uh, 20-something months, um, something clicks on the inside of the, that raccoon, and and that raccoon goes back to its instinctive nature, which is to claw and, and scrap and, and bite and, and wants to be back in nature. It wants, it, that's how it survives in nature. And the little girl's like, no, you don't see. She's, she's, my bandit would never do that. My bandit loves me. My bandit cares for me. My bandit gives me hugs and kisses, and and I hug it and kiss it. Sure enough, at the time when the veterinarian had told her, you you don't want to have a pet raccoon, you don't want to have a pet raccoon, at at that certain time frame, it'll switch. Sure enough, come that time frame, he switched. And he scratched her all up and bit her, and she wound up having a, have the raccoon euthanized. I think it would happen to me. I cared for that thing. I loved it. I nurtured it. I didn't think it would happen to me. The biggest moral failures in this world have happened when people would say, it will never happen to me. Even as people are pointing at them and saying, hey, y'all need to change. This is, this is not right. You shouldn't be spending time with that person. You shouldn't be surrounded by that, by that influence. No, I've got this covered. It will never happen to me. Maybe some of you have said that. And maybe some of you are walking in the regret of having said that in the past. And today you're dealing with the pain and the hurt of the sin that so easily tripped you up. And you're here because God has set you back again on course. And the reality is that this, you're never too far from God. And if you've tripped up in the past, if you've fallen in the past, God will pick you back up if you will allow him to. If you will keep running, if you will say, God, I want to keep moving forward. But you're going to live with the baggage of that. You're going to live with the hurt of that. And that's the reality. We, we, we don't want to live a life of regret. So we've got to discipline ourselves. We've got to discipline our hearts, our minds, so that when we run this race and we come to the end of it, that we are not disqualified. With every eye closed and every head bowed.
Do you want to live a life of integrity today? Have you calculated and counted the cost this morning? None of us wants to live a life of regret. And the only way that we can do that is by running with and towards integrity. As we look at the life of Joseph, as we examine his life, we know he's not the only one. The Bible talks about Daniel. And as Daniel is confronted with a situation in which all the satraps had kind of put this bug in the ear of King Nebuchadnezzar to cause all, every person to bow down only to him. Daniel was faced with the decision, am I going to continue to pray to God on my time, on the time that has been set for me, and not bow down to a false god. And he had that choice, just like you and I. We all have that choice. He had the choice. He, couldn't, he could have said, you know what? The reality is for the next 30 days, that's how long they were supposed to do this. For the next 30 days, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go to my normal place and pray uh, to God. I'm just going to kind of step back. And fall out of that routine. But that would have caused others to stumble. Because they all knew that that's what he did. That's why they set that trap up for him. He could have said, you know what? I'll go ahead and bow down. At this appointed time. But I'm just in my time. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to be quiet. Nobody's going to hear me. Nobody's going to watch me. But the reality is that people are still watching. And he would cause others to fall. Instead, he chooses to do the right thing. He chooses to follow his convictions and to continue his pattern of living the discipline that he knew that God had given him to live out. And because of it, he was thrown into the lion's den. Choices. Every one of us. What would you have done? Now, the reality is that God protected him there, but there have been many others who would come later on during the reign of Nero who would be thrown into lion's dens and they would be gobbled up and eaten because of their faith. We, we know the reality is that God doesn't always God doesn't always make us the survivors of attacks. But His promise is that He will be with us even in that circumstance even through those situations he will never leave you he will never forsake you I give you peace even in the midst of pain